Welcome back to The Contrarians, everyone. Uh, this is a Patreon-suggested topic, one we don't do very often, but I enjoy them when they come up. We're going to do a battle of the bands, and this time it's two hugely influential bands, UFO and Thin Lizzy. So today we're going to have Martin start us off with some thoughts on who wins the fight between UFO and Thin Lizzy. Martin, take it away. All right. So I actually did a whole podcast episode on these two bands as doppelgangers. It was episode 209, UFO and Thin Lizzy as doppelgangers. Um, so I'm definitely a big fan of these bands. And uh, of course, uh, I've got my four Thin Lizzy books that are still available at martinpopoff.com. And I've got my three UFO books that are available at martinpopoff.com. So yes, I'm a big fan of this, uh, these bands. Um, just to, as a little background of why I called them doppelgangers, um, you know, I I, uh, I find it interesting. They both started roughly around the same time, uh, 60, 68, 69. Um, first album for UFO is 70. First album for uh, Thin Lizzy is 72. Um, but one thing I find really interesting is that they both have two uh, albums that are not of their sound uh, to start off with. Then Lizzy starts with a little bit of a uh, kind of like a folk album uh, or two folk albums, uh, more more acoustic. They are a trio, but more more like uh, like Irish folk crossed with rock. And then, of course, um, uh, UFO starts with uh, with the, the Mick Bolton era where you've got uh, two albums that are like almost like I, I I call them like free demos. They sound like free, but not quite as good. And free is bad company demos to me uh, as well. But they do that. They do a live album. Uh, then they, uh, you know, UFO uh, keeps that same guitarist. I, I mean, sorry, Thin Lizzy keeps that same guitarist for one more record. And uh, and then they have a significant guitarist change. And UFO has a significant guitarist change for the phenomenon album of, of 1974. Um, you know, and, and, uh, I find it interesting as well that they were pretty much about, about, about as successful as each other. Um, you know, UFO might've had a little more success in the States. So uh, would they have this weird situation with Chicago? Um, but, uh, and Thin Lizzy may, may have been a little more successful, I suppose. Actually, we're going to hear from Parrish. He can, he can clear us up on this. But they were both pretty successful in, in the home country or, you know, Thin Lizzy in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and same with UFO. Um, I find it interesting that Thin Lizzy even adds a keyboardist later on. So now they've even got that sort of thing going. Um, and obviously, a big difference uh, in the bands is that, uh, you know, Thin Lizzy comes to a grinding halt and UFO continues. Um, but they both have a Phil as a lead singer and lyricist. And uh, even more uh, compelling, I think, is the idea that um, they both both bands belong in. Uh, I did another podcast episode on this called the Bruce Springsteen family. So they both belong in that in that family of artists that um, that are influenced by Van Morrison, them. Uh, Bruce Springsteen liked Thin Lizzy, uh, but Phil Mogg and and Phil Lynott both got a lot of Frankies and Johnnies and talking about the city and and getting the heck out of the city and crime and all that stuff. Story songs. Uh, so they're all part of that thing, as is Elvis Costello, Graham Parker, uh, John Mellencamp, Bon Jovi. So they're all part of this Bruce Springsteen family thing, I think. Um, and then but but these these two guys are are so linked because these bands are are so similar. Um, you've got Thin Lizzy having one gold album with Jailbreak and uh, everybody thinks Lights Out is gold, but it's not. Uh, so they get close with Lights Out. Um, but again, they they uh, they kind of uh, they all they're, they're very similar in uh, in how well they did did over time. Uh, and then finally, I, I find it interesting that you get um, another significant guitarist change in both of the bands where you've got Paul Chapman coming in and you get a whole sort of different era and different writing. And then in in uh, in Thin Lizzy, you have uh, have I been mixing up my Thin Lizzy and UFO in any of these? I I, I keep thinking I'm, I'm uh, not not in the facts, but in in saying the name of the band and then the fact. But anyways, so so um so Thin Lizzy also has a significant um, guitarist change uh, when when they lose Brian Robertson, they get Gary Moore, they get Snowy White, they get John Sykes. Uh, so they have that happen as well. So so they have a direction change. So. To, to cut out and, and both of them actually recorded with Ron Nevison, which is which is quite bizarre. Uh, then Lizzie had one album with them, Nightlife, and then Ron Nevison kind of is a fixture of 
of UFO. Uh, and actually, finally, one other thing. I find it really interesting that they are both pretty much exactly as heavy as each other. Um, they, they are literally both these bands that uh, that traffic in heavy metal about a third of each album, if you want to be blunt about it, over, over you know, generalizing out the whole thing. A lot of hard rock, a lot of ballads, uh, a fair bit of... Um, experimentation but they but neither band is is like wildly experimental um and then both bands are actually uh, a pretty big influence on the new wave of british heavy metal they're they're i i consider them both uh what i call second wave heavy metal bands i i i figure that you know you've got that first wave your black sabbath heap led zeppelin uh deal right uh black sabbath heap led zeppelin uh deep purple uh and then and then starting in the middle of the 70s you get you know the ascendance of ufo thin lizzy rainbow judas priest kind of thing so leading up to the new wave British heavy metal so uh all that said um my answer to the question is thin lizzy all the way i i think by a fair bit i i um i appreciate most of the Thin Lizzy uh, catalog a lot more. Uh, the the Mick Bolton years for UFO are dead to me. I don't I don't care about them at all. But I actually quite like those first two Thin Lizzy albums, and I like all of them all the way through. Um, you know, Thin Lizzy has the uh, you know the the good fortune or bad fortune slash mixed together of uh, of not continuing on after 1983. And UFO does some pretty pretty crappy music uh, through the rest of the 80s. Um, but uh, but generally speaking, uh, line it all up. Uh, I'm also a big Paul Chapman fan. Like I'm a big uh, supporter of of mechanics and certainly no place to run my favorite ufo album um so i really like those records a lot and people are often kind of surprised how you know the the shanker albums kind of leave me cold i'm not a massive 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 fan of those shanker albums so but thin lizzie all through though there those are some of my favorite albums of all time period um I, I call Renegade my favorite thin lizzie album so that's even a later one but every one of those thin lizzie albums i love to death um uh, but you know, other than those those kind of points about um, you know just just elevating them a little, they, they are still very similar and well put together, and really they're all they're all classics, right? They're all really you know nicely done records, um, and like I say, about as heavy as each other. But just for some reason, just matching it up all the way through, um, I would I would go with Thin Lizzy. You know, a, a, also if we did a bunch of you know a, a big massive song ranking. I would definitely have if we did a top 50 you know I, of mixing these together i would probably have i would probably have 30 thin lizzie songs in there and 20 ufo songs you know all all kind of dovetailing all over the place so there you go uh my my vote is for thin lizzie okay by the way martin uh just yesterday i was researching on the riaa website they do not have jailbreak listed as a gold album wow I cannot, I, I, that was what I thought too. And I looked every parameter I could think of on their search engine and it says Thin Lizzy have no certified albums. Wow. I've always assumed that uh, as well. So now, now they're even more similar because, because <laughs> everybody thinks jailbreak is gold and maybe it's not right. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I, I, I would bet it has over the years, but nobody's bothered. Well, that's a whole, it, I've done a whole podcast episode on that as well. Like I can guarantee you that's well over gold. If someone went back and did the Spotify thing for 1500 plays per album, just based on boys are back in town and jailbreak and cowboy song. I, I it's well over gold. If they went and recertified now, um, it might even be platinum based on uh, whatever Spotify says, uh, how, however many times boys are back in town has been played. Cause I went through that whole exercise with motorhead ACE of spades and ACE of spades is absolutely a gold album right. uh, now. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's go across the pond and get the British uh, opinion on this. Parrish, give us the okay, rundown well, on start, uh, Thin Lizzy. I'm going to start by confessing that this was my suggestion. Um, and, and it came about because in the last month or so, I found myself listening to both UFO and Thin Lizzy a lot. And I think the reason for that, from a UFO's point of view, is the new album by Phil Mogg, Mogg's Motel, which I think is really good, um, really liked it. And then more recently, Michael Schenker's release of, of, I guess you'd call them covers of UFO songs when he was in UFO. And I think, I think I'm right in saying they're all songs that appear on um, Strangers in the Night, and he's got various guest stars appearing on it. So that's kind of why I got back into a UFO thing. And then... With Thin Lizzy, it was the 
the box set that, that pulls together Jailbreak and Jolly the Fox, which is called 1976, and I've been listening to that quite a lot. So, so it took me back in time to, to 40 years ago because I had two best friends at school in, in the mid 70s, a guy called Clive, who was the biggest Thin Lizzy fan you could ever think of, and a guy called Guy, who was the biggest UFO fan you could ever think of. And all I ever heard at school during lunch breaks was them arguing over which was the better band. So actually this, this kind of took me back to that and, and got me thinking about them and thinking about those, those discussions. And I have to say, if you'd asked me this in, in the 70s, my answer would have been quite clearly Thin Lizzy. But I think over the years, I've, I've become more appreciative of UFO. And certainly in the last month or so, I've become a lot more... Um, appreciating of some some of the deep cuts on the UFO albums. So as I often do with these things, I thought I'd put together a scoring matrix to see how it comes up. And some of the mate, some of the scoring is subjective, and some of it's objective. And and starting with the objective tests I put on this is the um, the results from the UK charts. So I stress this is the UK charts. And so I, I first of all looked at which had the most top. 30 albums and they both had eight they both had eight top 30 albums in the uk um and then i drilled down a bit further to say how many top 10 albums have they had and in the case of ufo that had two strangers in the night and mechanics and in the case of thin lizzy that had six which was jailbreak bad reputation live and dangerous black rose chinatown and, and thunder and lightning so if I looked at it purely on album positions in the charts, then I would say Thin Lizzy comes out top. So my first score goes to Thin Lizzy. I then looked at singles, and this really surprised me, actually, because my recollection of this is very different. UFO did not have a single top 30 single in the UK. Now, my recollection is Shoot Shoot was a hit. Um, Only You Can Rock Me was a hit. Doctor Doctor was a hit. And, and yet none of those got into the charts at all. So, so they had no top 30 singles in the, UK, in the UK charts, whereas Thin Lizzy had 11. They had four top 10 singles, which was Whiskey in a Jar, Boys Are Back in Town, Waiting for an Alibi, and Killer on the Loose. And they had another four which got top 20, which it was Rosalie, Don't Believe a Word, um, Dancing Moonlight, and Do Anything You Want To. So clearly Thin Lizzy had a lot more single success. And, and to be honest, I think if I went out to people in the street of a similar age, most of them would know Thin Lizzy and would know Thin Lizzy songs. I'm not sure that that many would actually know UFO. So again, Thin Lizzy scored better on the objective test of top top 10 or top 30 singles. So at the moment, it's a score 2-0 two, two to Thin Lizzy. So I'll now come to the subjective tests. And I looked. I thought I'd look at the two favourite albums by them, you know, one of each. So my favourite Thin Lizzy album is Black Rose, and my favourite UFO album is Obsession. And whilst I like Boast a lot, I would give that to Obsession out of the two. So therefore, it's now two one, still with Thin Lizzy. I then looked at the live albums, Live and Dangerous, and Strangers in the, in the Night. And in the as I say, if I went back. 40 years, it would definitely have been live and dangerous, but now it's Strangers in the Night. Maybe because I haven't played it as often, it's still a bit as a bit fresher. So I'd give that to, to UFO as well. So it's now two all. I then thought, what are, what are my favourite singles? So that's Don't Believe a Word is my favourite Thin Lizzy single, and Lights Out is my favourite UFO single. And out of those two, I'd give that to Thin Lizzy. So don't believe a word. Um, so that's now 3-2, if I've got my numbers right, 3-2 to Thin Lizzy. I then saw both of them live a few times in the late in, in the um, 79 through to about 83. Um, I've seen UFO a lot more in more recent years, but, but during that period. So I thought I'd rate um, which one I thought was better. And I have to say, to be fair, in, in certainly in... Um, in Thin Lizzy's case, this probably was not their heyday. I mean, this was, when I saw Thin Lizzy, it was with Snowy White, who I did not think had any stage presence at all. 
Um, and then with, um, oh, what's his name? If my mind's gone a blank. Who, who was on? Um, Sykes? Yeah, John Sykes, who, who again, I was, ne- I was not a big John Sykes fan of, really at that time. Um, so I think I didn't see Thin Lizzy in their heyday. Um, UFO, on the, and, and therefore I was always a bit disappointed with Thin Lizzy whenever I saw them. Whereas UFO, I thought, were, were pardon the pun, phenomenal every time I saw them. So, um, so if I was scoring based on live live shows I'd been to, I'd give that to to um, UFO. And then my last um, subjective test was was the Beth Battle of the Fields, um, Phil Lynott versus Phil Mogg. And I think Phil Lynott is more charismatic. I think he's got more distinctive voice. Um, and I think actually he's probably a better front man. Although when I've seen UFO in recent years, I have, I've always been really impressed with Phil Mogg as much because he's like a stand-up comedian and when he talks in between between the tracks live. So he's always got that humor. But so I'd give that I'd give that to um to Phil Lynott out of them. So my final scores, if I was doing this, I'd give it to Thin Lizzy 4 and UFO 3 overall. But then I can't help but think UFO, if I looked at the subjective bit, which is which one do I actually like best, UFO came out on top. So on the basis that um, Martin went with Thin Lizzy, I'm going to go with UFO to be a bit more contrarian. So my vote goes to UFO. Okay. One all so far. Andrew, welcome to the show. Tell us uh, who you think is the winner of the battle of the bands here between UFO and Thin Lizzy. Okay. So as far as that goes, it all goes back to Def Leppard. Is it better to burn out or to fade away? So in for years, I have said that my favorite band in the whole world was Thin Lizzy. They are in Phil Lynott is just the consummate front man. He's got these great influences from all the way back to the Irish storytelling thing and then mixing it in with the Bruce Springsteen, the Bob Seger tradition that came out from from America. He integrated that in so perfectly. Some of those songs are just fantastic. And... He died in 1986. I was 15 at the time. When he died, I had no idea who he was. None. I didn't discover either of these bands until the 90s. UFO might have even been into the 2000s. Just totally not on my radar. I listened to a ton of hair metal growing up. I got into more metal and then I got into grunge and but during grunge I I got really really sick of the same thing which is what it felt like again and went well what else is out there and I started going back and discovering bands fell in love with Phil Lynott immediately so he, he was my number one up there for years and years and years I was so I was so fascinated by him. I just study him, watch all the videos I could of him, listen to his mom talk about him, read biographies about him, and just so I, I just loved everything about him. But it bugs me that he died so young when they had so much potential still. He had so much of potential. And to see what Phil Mogg has done. Phil Mogg has gotten the luxury of becoming an old man in rock and roll. And it's so cool what he has done with that, that they have been able to mature as a band, change as a band. And I know everybody hates those 80s records. I love them. Even even the one with Atomic Tommy M. Those, I know technically it's terrible, but Night Run is one of my favorite favorite UFO songs. I think that's got the best blending of that Bruce Springsteen mixed in with the English hard rock. 
fantastic. So, I'm down to the question though. UFO or Thin Lizzy? And I've got to go UFO for this. My favorite band in the world is going to get demoted for today, at least, because I think it is better to not to burn away. To no, I I messed that up. <laughs> it's better to get become an old man in rock and roll than it is I to see. die young and be some monolith hero. I think it's better. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. Very There's cool. There's definitely something to be said yeah. for longevity. Yeah. You know, I think Phil Mogg has that same thing that, that uh, I saw with uh, Ian from Deep Purple. They both became very casual about their careers as they got older. Yeah. And uh, I actually saw UFO uh, during the Vinnie Moore years at a club in Dallas. And I remember I could not understand the bloody word that man said the entire concert. Between the songs, it was just and uh, you yeah. know, so some That's great. Scary about interviewing that. him. He really, yeah. he basically talks like Keith Richards or Ozzy, right? He's got, oh yeah, uh, he's just got that South London accent. I mean, it, and it makes. I mean, that's maybe why I think he's like a stand-up comedian because he just make it just cracks me up every time I hear him talk. Yeah, yeah. it's just yeah, so well, funny. I guess if you can understand trail what he's off saying. too, right? He's, it's like he mumbles away and his thoughts trail away, sort of thing, right? So. Yeah. As old men will do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Reed, before right. you go on, I just wanted to catch up a, a couple more notes from my podcast episode. So, uh, sure. so yeah, definitely, uh, you know, in, in the comparison thing, both of them have big, super respected live albums. We've never really said, and they're both around the same time, 78, 79. Um, Phil Mogg gets into fights. Brian Robertson gets into fights. Even Phil Lina got into the odd fight, right? So they're they're fighting guys. Um, but both have a song called Fool's Gold. Um, then we've got Cowboy Joe, Cowboy Song, Fighting, Fighting Man, The Wild One, Wild One, Give It Up, I've Got to Give It Up, Ballad of the Left Hand Gun, and Ballad of a Hard Man. So they've got, you know, there's going to be some comparisons there as well. And finally, both are on kind of mid-paced UK labels, uh, Chrysalis versus Vertigo. So there were a lot of a lot of ways these line up, but anyways, go ahead. Back to you. So the the other thing I, I I didn't mention earlier that I meant to mention is is obviously the focus has been a little bit around the two fields, but but you could also look at the bass playing with with Pete Way. I mean Pete Way was a fantastic bass player, and and again was another really good live performer. Um, so I think that that comes out, and then the guitarists. I mean, as you said earlier. Um, Martin, they, they had a revolving door to some extent with guitarists, but they both seemed to be able to pick really good guitar players. So whenever they had to replace, and, and you're right, Tonka Chapman in, in many ways is as good, if not better, as, as, a, um, as a song guitarist, maybe not as a lead guitarist in my view. I think Schenk is a better lead guitarist. Mm. But if you're looking for somebody who plays the song, then I think, I think Chapman's the better guitarist. So... Um, and he wrote as well, but but also wrote, Neil yeah. Carter wrote did a lot of the writing. Yeah. yeah, so so they are complete bands. They're not just the two individuals. Although I found myself focusing a bit too, too much on the two individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the other thing we haven't spoken about is both bands were essentially destroyed by drugs, yeah, and 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 alcohol. You know, they they were the reasons that the bands couldn't stick together, couldn't stand each other, and the and the reasons they fell apart really. So. They've got that parallel as well. In, and the reasons that. they didn't break the states sort of as well, right? Yeah. They both remain sort of sandwich bands on three band bills and things, right? Yeah. So so I think you're right. I think there's a lot of comparison between them, but but I just wanted to, you know, you shouldn't forget the quality of the guitarists, I think, that both bands had, because that was was a key characteristic and 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 also the bass playing. Well, and the drumming for that matter, and the keyboards. I mean, they are both they are both really good. Uh, musician or, or you know the bands were both full of good musicians even even with the changes so yeah I, I... Well, leave me a little something to say Parrish <laughs> sorry <laughs> back to you Reed. <laughs> all right so uh I've got some statistics uh some of them have been gone over and some of them are, have not but since I'm old now I can't remember what's already been said I'm just going to go through all of these so uh, we'll start with UFO first album, 1970. I have never paid attention to when a band started. I don't care about their developmental process. I just, they are born the day that first album comes out to me. So uh, UFO's 1970, they eventually put out 22 
studio albums. Their most recent album was 2017. That blew my mind. I didn't know they were still putting in. It's a covers album, which uh, I won't go. Someday maybe we'll do a show on terrible covers albums. I haven't heard it. Maybe it's fantastic. I just am skeptical. No. <laughs> um, they they put out two unknown albums, as, as Martin has uh, mentioned, mostly unknown except to really hardcore fans. They hit the classic lineup on album three. That lineup put out five albums in three years. And then they started the revolving door of new members. Uh, they produced a hugely influential live album, Strangers in the Night, released January 79. Uh, no, I mentioned this earlier, no gold or certified platinums in America. They only had one top 40 US album in the States, and that was Lights Out, hit number 23. They had six top 40 albums. Now, uh, the UK has changed their charts over the years, and it starts to get a little weird when you're looking at, they were on this chart and not this chart. Um, but what I see is they had six top 40 albums with actually Mechanics being the highest rated album. But that may have been on a different chart. No, 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 um, and it was It was the highest rating. And the second they, was um, No Place to Run. But uh, 2012's Seven Deadly was number one on the UK rock albums chart. And I don't know what kind of impact that chart has. Um, now this, uh, I thought this had to be a mistake because according to Wikipedia, the only top 40 single that UFO ever, ever had in the United States is The Writer from Mechanics. And that's a badass song, but <clears throat> is it a single? I mean, I don't remember ever hearing that back in the day. And yet Wikipedia says it went to a, uh, Oh, excuse me, it went to number 23. Hmm. Good grief. Um, UFO, yeah, it's funny, Parrish, when you said they don't have any songs in the top 30, because uh, in America we always say the top 40, because they had two songs that hit in the top 40, uh, Dr. Dr. Live hit number 35 and Youngblood hit 36, but they never broke a top 30 ceiling. Uh, yeah, the, re the reason I go top 30 is we only really introduced the top 40 in, in about 1980. So all the way through the 70s, it was always in the UK. We only ever spoke about the top 30. No, ah, okay. Learn, live and learn. Now, according to Chrysalis Records, uh, who have the UFO catalog, UFO has sold more than 20 million records over the course of their career. So... It's pretty good. Now, 22 albums, 20 million records worldwide. You know, they may not be a giant band, but that's respectable sales. Now we go to Thin Lizzy, first album, 1971. Released three albums with their former lineup, don't really get any traction. And then they hit the classic lineup on album four. And just like UFO, part of the doppelganger, they put out five albums with the classic lineup in, four, in three years. And then it splinters again. So uh, that's a really close parallel. Uh, their live album, considered one of their best, 1978. So uh, they're right in there fighting with UFO the whole time. Lots of guitar player changes. They had the keyboardist for the last three albums. Their last album comes out in 83. Now, this is, I have no way of verifying this one. Sometimes this website has great information and sometimes they are way off, but they have Thin Lizzy listed at only 3.5 million albums for their entire career. Yeah, that that's way too low. Worldwide, yeah, that's way too low. Yeah, that that's what I thought. There there isn't anybody else I could find that has a, a, an amalgam of their numbers, but they certainly have sold over their career less than UFO, if only by dent of UFO having so many more albums. Mm -hmm. uh, they had one top forty song in America. The boys are back in town. Uh, Cowboy Song was a very minor hit. I think it hit like 153 or something. I mean, it's it's considered a classic now, but it made no impact during the day. Maybe my favorite Thin Lizzy song. Um, lots of, as Parrish said, lots of top 40 singles in the UK, including the posthumous song. Dedication was a hit after Phil Lynott died. Um, now, of course, Lizzy's statistics are somewhat skewed uh, by Phil Lynott's early death. So, like pretty much everybody, I immediately thought, oh, well, Finn Lizzie's the, the going to be the winner here because I've been listening to Finn Lizzie a lot longer than UFO. Uh, so I just feel like I have more emotional connection to them. 
But when you start laying them out as factors, it starts to look like a dead heat. And uh, I also, Martin, I also started off with the fact that they both have singers named Phil. So the whole street poet thing, but let's not forget that both of those guys had a really weird vocal delivery. It's very loose with the timing. They don't sing on the beat. And that is very unusual in the world of rock and roll. So these two doppelganger bands had really uh, iconic frontman styles. And it's the same style. So that's very weird. Um, I, I hear a lot that Lynette was more charismatic than Mog. I never saw Thin Lizzy live. Um, I mean, he comes off fine on that live album. That's all I have to judge by. Uh, and Reed, they both don't have very high voices either, right? No, they're they're very speaking voice range. I guess that's your chest voice, right? My, uh, my knowledge of, of singing is not real technical. Um, now, both bands are hugely influential on hard rock and metal. In this case, uh, both bands were huge influences on the new wave of British heavy metal. You know, famously Iron Maiden, all of that, you know, uh, not so much. Um, uh, oh my gosh, Harris, not so much Steve Harris. He doesn't say that he was really influenced by Thin Lizzy, but very much UFO. I mean, his whole look is is Pete Way, um, but the guitarists were definitely influenced by Thin Lizzy. But also, UFO was a huge influence on American thrash, and Thin Lizzy were a huge influence on American hair metal. So there's a influence in the hard rock community by these bands far in excess of their commercial success, at least in the states. Um, and now, as bass players go, Pete Way. I would have to give him the nod as being way more influential than Phil Lynott, if nothing else than introducing those stupid skin-tight striped trousers that he wore that so many English bassists adopted. Um, I mean, there was like a cottage industry in those, I guess. They all bought them from the same tailor on a, on Fleet Street or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah I, much I, more I, influential. Um, probably a thought you don't want to hear, but I actually had a pair back in the day <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> okay. Um, it, as, as Paris rightly pointed out, both bands are very well known for their guitar players. And now this is where we hit one of the real separations to me. Thin Lizzy are much more known for their melodies and their twin guitar harmonies, whereas Thin Lizzy are known for their riffs and their solos. So you mean so, UFO? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean UFO. Mm. UFO are much more riff oriented in their music, whereas Thin Lizzy much more melodic in their approach. Um, I think, this is just my opinion, I think that Thin Lizzy is a little more stylistically similar from album to album, but on each album they explore a number of different varieties of music. UFO is very different from album to album, but each album tends to be pretty homogenous. The, the songs are all within a pretty narrow range on each album. So almost exactly mirrored uh, for that one particular thing. Um, again, clearly Thin Lizzy was the singles band. Uh, over their lifetime, UFO has sold a lot more albums. Um, going back and just looking at my own listening history, I have listened to a lot more Thin Lizzy, but then I really dug into it, and it's really only three albums. I listened to uh, Johnny the Fox, Chinatown, and um, Bad Reputation, almost exclusively. Whereas with UFO, I don't listen to the albums as much, but I tend to listen to the entire Schenker and Chapman catalog. So uh, it really does come out of dead heat. So. I kind of come out of this exercise with my head saying, I think UFO's probably the winning band, but my heart still says Thin Lizzy. So I'm going to go Thin Lizzy and end us on a tie where we've got two Thin Lizzy and two UFO, and people are just going to have to make up their own damn minds. Sounds good. Good stuff, man. Excellent. All right. Anybody have any wrap-up points? Martin? I don't think so. I think I, I went through the whole thing. Um, yeah, I, I just, I definitely feel like I have way, way more than Lizzie songs in my top favorite songs of all time, period, um, kind of thing. But uh, but yeah, I, lo I love UFO a lot as well. I love Wild Willing the Innocent, No Place to Run a lot. Like I say, I like the Tonka records better than the Shanker records. Um, and I think, I think, um, 
Yeah, well, we didn't really talk about production. They're, they they all have slight warbles in the production quality, but generally speaking, they're they're all fairly well produced, fairly correctly produced uh, sort of records. So I guess that's about it. Okay, Harish, any last minute? Well, I, thoughts? I, I suppose the only thing I would add, which is back in the day, I didn't like Chinatown, Renegade, or Thunder and Lightning very much. I kind of went off them, but but similarly, I didn't really like Mechanics, Wild, and um, Willing and the Innocent, or Nowhere to Run very much either. And yet now, I would say I think both those three albums pairings or, or whatever are, are, are fantastic, and I think they really stood the, the test of time. I, I mean. Renegade was a real flop at the time. I mean, I don't even think it, met, it hit the top 30 in the UK. And yet I go back to Renegade now, and I think it's an excellent album. Um, and, and No Place to Run is definitely a very close second now to my favourite UFO album. So those, those sort of very early 80 albums have, have um, I think, really stood the test of time. Um, more so than, than maybe some of the classic albums in my mind. Um, and, the, and the other thing I would say is if, if people are a fan of UFO, go and listen to Mog's Motel. I mean, his voice is fantastic. It's really strong. And the songwriting is excellent. I mean, it's not all, it doesn't all sound like UFO, um, but it's a definite, really good hard rock album. And, and as I say, his vocals are fantastic. So if you like UFO, I think, I think you'd enjoy um, Mog's Motel, and it's definitely worth checking out. Sweet. All right. Oh, and the other thing is, it's probably the the other thing is it makes. I mean, you, you talked about Maiden. Maiden start every show with um, Doctor Doctor, Doctor, don't they? They come right. on to Doctor Doctor, and I do wonder how much of an influence that's had over the years of people going out and you know finding out about the song and therefore finding out about UFO. And, and certainly, yeah. I, I don't know if they get royalties, but if Phil Mogg gets royalties off the back of that, he might, he'd, he'd be a very rich man now, I think, because yeah. <laughs> they play it every yeah, right. show. Yeah. Well, technically, oh. any public performance of a uh, of a song that has a copyright is due royalties. Now, mm -hmm. whether they actually collect them, I have no idea. Hmm. All right, Andrew, wrap up thoughts? Uh, just... Um... I'm not sure how you guys feel about it, but I, in my opinion, I think a lot of the contrarian stuff has to do with us being such big fans of the music that we delve down in deeper than most people. So the fact that, that a lot of us tend to like the 80s albums really well, I think speaks so much of us listening to the earlier albums and going like, yeah, these are great, but I'm a little sick of this. Let's let's delve into this stuff and um it's produced just a wealth of material that really really for both of these bands both thin lizzy and ufo has been instrumental in those albums becoming bigger over the years nice yeah. stuff. I mean, for nice. sure anybody who is is either participating in these panels or watching these videos is in the one percent of music listeners we are not casual fans uh one point i also was going to make and i'll just leave it with this if you look at the cultural impact of the bands, and I don't mean on, the, I've already mentioned the cultural impact on hard rock and metal, but just in society in general, here in the States at least, you have to give it to Thin Lizzy. No one knows who UFO is. They, there are no songs that UFO gets played on classic rock radio, whereas you will always hear the boys are back in town. Um, you know, the last time I went to the Dallas Guitar Show, there was a 15 year old kid playing the cowboy song in one of the guitar booths. So uh, just in terms of general Americana, Thin Lizzy definitely get the nod for the overall impact. Nice. Cool. All right, everyone. So that is Battle of the Bands UFO versus Thin Lizzy. Came out in the tie. Let us know in the comments which one you prefer. Feel free to check out. We got these t we got these t-shirts. We've got uh, Patreon and I don't even know what else we've got. You can check the, the links. If Marco is doing his job, there'll be information in the links below. And uh, we hope to see you real soon in another Contrarians video. Thank you, everyone. That was a All lot right. of fun. Thanks, guys. That was fun.